Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Pierre Atlas. I'm a political science professor here and I serve as director of the Richard Luger Franciscan Center for Global Studies. Welcome to Marion University and to the first event of our 14th year of the speaker series. And um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Global Studies program and the center here at Marion. And then um, we'll get the ball rolling with our event. Uh, I don't know if you all picked up a brochure outside. This is a brochure. Uh, they're available outside for uh, the speaker series for this year. All of our events are free and open to the public. And tonight is not only the first uh, event of the year, it's also the first event of a three-part series on my, uh, excuse me, on um, a three-part series on refugees and migration. So after tonight, in October, we will have uh, the German Consul General coming from Chicago to speak on uh, the uh, refugee crisis in Europe and its impact on the European Union. And then in November, after the election, we will have uh, Dr. Uh, John Francis Burke of Trinity University in San Antonio, the author of a book called Building Bridges, Not Walls, come and speak on Building Bridges, Not Walls in the 21st Century World of Migration. And that is about um, uh, Hispanic immigration into the United States and its impact on culture, but in particular on um, parishes in the Catholic Church. And that event will be uh, co-sponsored by the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. And then in December, on Sunday, December 4th, we have our annual Global Studies Lecture by uh, the retired uh, U.S. Senator Richard Luger. And then we'll have two events in the spring semester. In January, at the, at the Marion University Theater, which is at Marion Hall, that way, um, we will have uh, an event with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra um, called uh, Beyond Words, Music of the Earth, with uh, the ISO's associate conductor, Vince Lee. And he will be uh, discussing and taking questions and talking about and performing um, bits from uh, Gustav Mahler's The Song of the Earth. And that coincides with uh, the January um, Festival of the Earth month that the uh, Symphony Orchestra is going to be doing um, down at the Hilbert Circle Theater. And we're, do we're expanding other ways for the ISO and Marion University to collaborate during that month, including with our uh, science program. And then finally in March of 2017, our final event of this year's speaker series will actually be a film. And we're going to debut the Indianapolis screening of a film called The Sultan and the Saint. And it is a docudrama about a very famous meeting between St. Francis of Assisi and um, a, an Egyptian sultan during the Crusades, where uh, Assisi actually met with the, with the sultan, and um, although his, attempt, his original idea was to convert him, um, basically uh, came to understand that the sultan and, and, the, and the, the Muslims in Egypt that he was dealing with uh, were, were worshiping the same god. And he went back to Italy, St. Francis did, and basically told the Franciscan order not to get involved in the Crusades. And this is a docudrama, it's an interfaith event, and that will be uh, March 17th, uh, excuse me, Mar March uh, 16th, 2017. So these are all of our events. Um, please come to as many as you like. Uh, they are all free and open to the public, including uh, the film. And so uh, this, is, this is one of the things that we do with the Luger Franciscan Center. The other thing that the Luger Franciscan, Cent Franciscan Center does is it sponsors our uh, academic minor in global studies. And the academic minor, in the, how many people in the, in the room here are in the global studies program? Okay, very good. Um, so the minor in global studies fits with any major at Marion University in the professional art, professional studies or arts and sciences. We have uh, uh, business majors, secondary education majors, nursing majors, and then we have um, all sorts of other uh, science and, and liberal arts majors uh, minoring in global studies. It involves uh, uh, specially designed courses in uh, global studies from different disciplines. Uh, required study abroad experience and an additional um, year of foreign language study. And, uh, and if anybody's interested in talking to me about that, I'd be happy to talk to you about it during the uh, reception. We also have Luger Fellow scholarships, academic scholarships for uh, incoming freshmen interested in minoring in global studies. And if there's anybody here, your, your kids or your grandkids thinking about marrying, I'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. And then also one of the things that's uh, one of the neat perks about being in the Global Studies program is over spring break I take some Luger Fellows and other Global Studies students to Washington, D.C., and we spend uh, the entire spring break in Washington um, staying at Catholic University, visiting with our senators and congressmen. We visit the Chinese Embassy, we go to the World Bank, we go to think tanks, we do all sorts of really, really interesting things and get to see sort of the inside of Washington in ways that most people don't get to do. And that's part of the Global Studies program too. So that is our, our what, what the Luger Franciscan Center um, for Global Studies does. Um, and now what I'd like to do is get the ball rolling for tonight. And so what I'm going to do is introduce um, Teresa Chambly of the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, who will tell you a little bit about um, CRS and introduce our speaker tonight. 
After the event is over tonight here in this room, we will have a reception outside in the hallway in the lobby with uh, refreshments where we can all talk and you can meet with the speaker, you can have your pictures taken and all that. So uh, thanks again for coming and enjoy the evening. Uh, Teresa Chandler. So I get the great honor of uh, introducing Erin Atwell this evening. So Erin, um, she'll share with us her work with CRS in Iraq and Turkey um, and how that has shaped her view of the region and her understanding about the social, political, and religious realities of life in the Middle East. Before her work in humanitarian aid, Atwell coordinated it says Atwell here, but I'd like to say Aaron, coordinated um, interreligious peace building projects for CRS in Egypt. She is an expert on international political economies and development, currently splitting her time uh, between refugee programming for CRS in Turkey and studying Islamic cultures at the University of Chicago. So it's a great privilege that I introduce Aaron to you. I had lunch with my friend and colleague Omar a couple of weeks ago when I was in southern Turkey. Our conversation covered a range of topics, including the challenges he faced living far from his family and friends, and my challenges facing similar distance from my family and my friends. It covered what was happening at the office, it covered um, our shared work in Turkey, and on one hand, it may have seemed that what constituted our conversation would be any conversation between any two work colleagues anywhere around the world. Um, but I was struck at the time, and I continue to be struck by the profound differences but between what might constitute any normal work conversation and our conversation. You see, Omar is Syrian, and he is far from his family because his family's still in northern Syria in a village where he's from that he can't access. When the uprisings in Syria began in 2011, Omar was part of a group of student activists who wanted to get involved and wanted to fight for freedom and democracy in Syria. He was arrested for his demonstrating activities, and he was detained for 35 days. At the end of the 35 days, he was fortunately, um, and better than what a lot of others have been through, he was released, but he had to flee his hometown and eventually flee Syria. He ended up in Turkey, where he joined a different humanitarian aid organization and eventually CRS. Now Omar is one of the managers of our um, food distribution program. When having conversations like this, I am often astounded by what my Syrian colleagues and the Syrians I meet have been through, what their families have been through. In that conversation, however, I was particularly struck by the ways in which Omar's life could have turned out completely differently. Omar told me about a friend of his uh, who was arrested with him back in 2011. They had grown up going to the same schools, attending the same mosque, and were involved in the same protests. They were both arrested, and they were both detained, and they were both released after 35 days. Omar's friend, however, decided that he wanted to stay in Syria and keep fighting for what he believed was freedom and democracy in Syria. Omar didn't hear from his friend for the three or four years between being released and getting news, getting the news that his friend had died in Syria in the fighting. So I experienced in that moment when Omar was telling me about his friend this cognitive dissonance wherein I thought, okay, here's my friend and colleague who I've known now for more than two and a half years during my work in Turkey who passionately and compassionately works for the well-being of Syrians in Turkey. He gives all that he has. He has no family with him and he is constantly working for the betterment of Syrians. And I think how is it that led him to be in Turkey and following this life and that led to his friend's death in Syria. It's discomforting 
Definitely, it feels a little too accidental. And it definitely didn't fit into a much easier way of me thinking some people are good and some people are bad, some people are evil, some people are not. Here were two young men from the same town and both saying what they wanted was freedom for their country and for their, for their countrymen who took very different paths with radically different outcomes. So my work with Catholic Relief Services in the Middle East, first in Egypt, on the left, then in Lebanon, Iraq, and Turkey has been profoundly transformative in this respect. Every time I think I begin to understand something, something about the relationship between, let's say, Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims, or Iraqi Kurds and Iraqi Arabs, um, or pro-government people in Syria and anti-government people in Syria, I meet somebody who leads me to question everything that I had thought that I had understood about the situation. I learned that trying to simplify what happens in the Middle East into these are good and these are bad is not helpful at all. It's the constant challenging of my own assumptions and the people I meet that helps me more usefully understand what's going on. This evening, what I'm going to do is talk about my work with Catholic Relief Services, like Teresa said, in Iraq and in Turkey. And along the way, I'll weave in narratives of people I have met and people I know along the way. At the end, as I understand there are some students here, I'll talk a bit about the trajectory that led me um, to my work. So in Iraq, I work with uh, a young man named, let's, these names are not their real names. We're calling him Zane tonight. Zane is from Mosul in Iraq. Let's see. Yes. Mosul, here we go. Zane is from Mosul in Iraq. And in August 2014, uh, his wife gave birth to their first child. August 2014 also happens to be when ISIS took over Mosul, causing a mass exodus of people from the town. So Zayn was, con oh no, we gotta go back. Um, Zayn was concerned about his wife and his new child and their well-being. They're Sunni Muslims, so they were not forced to leave like some other religious groups who I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. But he was particularly concerned about his wife and his child and wanted them to have a strong and stable life. So they left Mosul and they came to Duhok, which is up here near the border with Turkey. In Duhok, Zayn joined Catholic Relief Services, where he is one of our project managers um, for a livelihood support program. Zayn was devout, is devout, in his Muslim faith. He would pray some of his five prayers a day at the office, three of which usually incurred during working hours, wherein he would discreetly take his prayer rug, go into an empty office, lay it down, say his prayer before going back to work. When I talked to Zayn about his faith, he told me that when he was saying his prayers, his intentions, or do'at, the type of petitions that he would pray to God for during his prayers were for his parents. His parents weren't able to flee Musul like he was. They were too old and too frail to get in these large trucks that they were able to leave uh, Musul in to go to Duhok. And so they were still in Musul. And as far as I'm aware, they still are to this day. Now, Zane struggled because on the one hand, he understood why his parents stayed in Mosul. They were old, that it wasn't going to be easy for them to leave. But on the other hand, he felt a little bit of guilt in that, in a way, he felt that his parents were being complicit in what ISIS was doing by not leaving. By participating in their daily life in Mosul, he felt, okay, how are my parents in, in certain ways supporting what's happening in Mosul? On the other hand, the third hand, it is inevitable for the Iraqi community. They know that it is very likely that the Iraqi government forces together with US-led coalition forces will try to retake Mosul from ISIS sometimes in the, sometime in the near future. And Zayn lives in constant fear that when that happens, it will result in the loss of his parents. So 
So I'm constantly bombarded with these types of complex circumstances when I'm overseas. Many Syrians have stories similar to Omar, and many Iraqis have stories similar to that of Zayn. Syria had long been considered, prior to 2011, one of the most stable countries in the Middle East. It was a place that prided itself on welcoming others and taking in refugees, refugees from Iraq, Palestinian refugees. Also, it was a place that was a home to people of many diverse faiths. So in Syria, you would find Sunni Muslims, Alawite Muslims, you would find Syriac Catholic Christians, Assyrian Christians, Roman Catholic Christians, each with their own community of believers and each with their own houses of worship. When I was in graduate school in New York, I had an Arabic professor who was Syrian, and this was in 2000, early 2011. So many of you, I imagine, remember when uprisings started, uprisings started happening in Tunisia and then Egypt, and people thought, wow, Arab Spring, what is happening? My Syrian Arabic teacher told me, what's happening in Egypt and what's happening in Tunisia will never happen in Syria. It's too stable of a country for any possible conflict to happen. Yet, we know millions of Syrians now are just struggling to survive. Another Syrian colleague in Turkey, we'll call him Ahmed, was going through a particularly difficult time last September. While he was living in Turkey, working for Catholic Relief Services on an agriculture program, his wife and children were still living in Syria. He had come to Turkey before the borders between Turkey and Syria were closed by the Turkish government. He felt last year that it would be too risky to send for his wife and children now that the borders were closed. They would have to have crossed over illegally, and it wasn't a risk he was willing to take. Yet, he had a particular concern about his oldest son, a 16-year-old son. Now, it is well known among the Syrian community in southern Turkey and northwest Syria that a 16-year-old young man is the perfect target for recruitment into an armed group. And so Ahmed, was laying awake at night every night thinking about his 16-year-old son and what is, what is he going to do? Is he going to let him stay in Syria and risk the possibility of him being targeted? So Ahmed took the risk and had his son go with a distant relative, first crossing illegally into Turkey and then taking a raft from Turkey to Europe. Now his son made it to Sweden uh, where he was welcomed by uh, a nonprofit organization, and since he was a minor, he was put into youth apartments with other refugee minor children. He was enrolled in Swedish classes and into school. Now it's been um, just over a year since he made it to Sweden, and he knows Swedish, and he is um, planning on applying to go to university starting next year. So personally, when I first started hearing stories of Syrians taking rafts from Turkey to Europe, I thought, how incredibly irresponsible of these parents. How could somebody possibly allow their wife or their children or their brothers or their sisters to get on a raft, wherein many times people die along the way in order just to get to Europe? But it was with the story of Ahmed that I began to see for him, the cost and the benefit, that there was no doubt. He was going to do whatever it took to protect his son. And fortunately, uh, the update to the story is uh, Ahmed told me a couple of weeks ago that um, he, the situation in his hometown got to be a bit too dangerous, and so he was able to bring his wife and the rest of his children into Turkey. It was not easy, but um, through the support of some of his friends in Turkey, he was able to get the Turkish authorities to let them cross over legally. So now Ahmed and all of his other children and his wife are together in Turkey, um, with the exception of his eldest son, who is doing well in Sweden. So Ahmed's children attend Syrian school in Turkey. 
It's part of an education program funded and supported, developed by Catholic Relief Services with the local Syrian community and with the Turkish authorities. CRS has been active in the psychosocial support and education sectors in southern Turkey since early 2013, when we first set up what we call our Child Friendly Spaces Project. So Child Friendly Spaces are a tent, literally a tent, just like this one, that is set up in areas where members of the ref refugee community are living. We train local volunteers, often teachers or formal, former preschool teachers, um, all, all kinds of individuals who are from the local refugee community um, to offer recreational games and activities for children, mentoring, counseling, and some basic education. The idea being that initially, while we all see education is vitally important for all children, it takes time to set up a school. So when the Syrian children arrived in southern Turkey, there were no schools in Arabic, the language spoken by the Syrian children. All the schools were in Turkish. And even if they were able to speak Turkish, the schools, most of them at least, were full to capacity with local Turkish children. So our immediate response was, okay, a lot of people flooding into southern Turkey, we're going to set up these spaces. Very easy, fast to set up. It's just to tend, hire some people, and start some games with the children. The physical element of just being able to move around is very important for children in these situations. When we started the Child Friendly Spaces project in southern Turkey, the number one request from mothers was that they just have a space for their children to move. They were spending their days cramped in their homes in tiny apartments that were shared with other families, hearing stories of the horrible things that were happening in Syria, watching the news, and their mothers just wanted a safe place for them to go and spend some time and play like any other children would like to do. The child-friendly spaces targeted children not in school. However, over time, we've transitioned to have from having just child-friendly spaces to having also education programs. As time went on, it became clear that while in the beginning, a lot of Syrians thought like, okay, I'm going to get to go back to my hometown in a, you know, another six months, the conflict will be over. Another year, the conflict will be over. As time has passed, a lot of families are resigned to the fact that they may be in southern Turkey for a while. So we transitioned to an education program. We started working with the local community to set up community schools, schools that were recognized, approved by the Turkish authorities that had Syrian teachers and taught the Syrian curriculum. The idea with the community schools is that at the end of their schooling, the children would receive a diploma and would be allowed to enter Turkish universities at the end of high school, something that was not previously available to Syrian children. However, the transition has uh, also been accompanied by some particular problems with the Turkish community. So let's imagine we're in Indianapolis, if a suburb of Indianapolis, I'm from the suburbs of Chicago, so that's what I can envision, something similar, a suburb is suddenly inundated with a million people from, from Canada who are fleeing something happening in Canada, and they have no place to live, and they have no access to food, no access to education, no access to health services. In the beginning, the people from the community in Indianapolis might be really welcoming and say like, oh yeah, come stay with me and my family. Sure, I'll give you a discount on these food items and be really supportive and welcoming as people generally, in my experience, are in the beginning. I remember the first time I went to southern Turkey, it was in 2012, and that's the very well, overwhelmingly, the uh, feeling I got from the Turkish community. Very welcoming, very happy to have this Syrians, very understanding and empathetic, but as those million Canadians stay in that one suburb of Indianapolis over time, that welcome starts to wear off. The hospitality is no longer to the same degree as people start asking, okay, food prices are going up now, rent prices are going up now, and now it's becoming difficult for the natives of that town to even live themselves. 
So over time, relations between the Syrian and the Turkish communities have um, been a bit more challenging. So starting last year, as we were getting feedback from Turks in the community and from Syrians in the community, that relations weren't great, we worked with each of them to say like, okay, what would help this? And a lot of people said, we're so isolated from one another, we don't even know who the other are. So we began what we call bridge building activities, which are activities that can be very simple. They can be something as simple as a museum trip between um, Syrian and Turkish children or a cooking class for Syrian and Turkish parents or a theater um, play that's put on between Syrian and Turkish adolescents. So as our projects progress over time and everyone's realizing that this conflict isn't ending anytime soon, we're transitioning more into education and also into social capacity building and bridge building activities. An essential part of all of CRS's work, especially in emergency locations, is understanding the dynamics of locations of displacement, of host communities and hosted communities, and recognizing that it's our role to talk to those from the host community and those who are displaced to understand what they need to feel comfortable in their social interactions. I was at the home of one of my Syrian friends two weeks ago, and he and his wife had invited me over for Eid dinner, Eid being the major Muslim holiday that honors Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son on God's order. I sat with my friend Abdurrahman and his wife Zainab and their four children who are 15, 14, 7, and 5 years old. They fled Syria four years ago. All four, six of them were able to leave together before the borders closed, so they've been in southern Turkey for four years. The 15-year-old child told me how last year he started making a more concerted effort to make Turkish friends because he thought I'm really thinking my chances of going home to Syria are slim anytime soon, and I want to learn Turkish so I can go to Turkish University. So the oldest son, the 15-year-old, has been making a strong effort to learn Turkish and make Turkish friends. The 14-year-old uh, daughter is a bit more shy, and she said she doesn't like to reach out to Turks in the community who are her age because she's afraid that because she's Syrian, they won't like them, or they won't like her. The seven-year-old, what he had to tell me was about how much he loves Taekwondo. So he is enrolled in Taekwondo classes in southern Turkey, and he's seven. He was three when he left Syria, and frankly, he has no memory of it. For him, life has always been living in southern Turkey, being an outsider, and he takes joy in the parts of life that any other seven-year-old child might take joy in. The seven-year-old, the 14-year-old, and the 15-year-old attend Syrian community schools like the one supported by CRS, but their parents told me that starting next year they plan on their children enrolling in Turkish schools because they plan to be here for the long haul. So when I was last in Iraq, I'll shift to Iraq for a little bit here, which was uh, a summer ago, a year ago, I did a field visit to one of CRS's project sites in a similar program as Turkey, the Child Friendly Spaces program, in a place called Sharia. The people of Sharia are of the Yazidi faith and come from just outside of Mosul, the city that I mentioned previously. When ISIS entered their city, Residents were forced to flee, residents of the Yazidi community in particular, as well as other religious minorities, were forced to flee with nothing but the clothes on their backs. They had no time to gather their possessions. In some cases, family members of theirs were kidnapped and they didn't see them for a year, two, three, four years. The families found refuge in Sharia, this town, you can see a really lovely town here. Um, and the Yazidis in particular, were targeted because of their minority status um, and certain misconceptions about their belief system. 
In addition, other groups were targeted by ISIS when they came to Mosul in 2014, including Christians, Shia Muslims, and Turkmen. The Yazidis are of an ancient religion that predates Christianity, and they were particularly vulnerable as thousands were trapped on a mountain for days with no access to food or water. While Christians in particular benefited from being connected to global Christian networks, the Yazidis had no such connections. And so when CRS began our emergency response in northern Iraq, we found a lot of Christian groups were already connected to different organizations around the world, and the Yazidis were left with nothing. So one of the actions that CRS took, identifying one of the most vulnerable communities, was to come to Sharia and see, okay, what's going on here? What needs to be done? Many families were living in unfinished buildings. Unfinished buildings that were part of a government project um, maybe a decade ago to promote development in this part of northern Iraq, but the project ran out of funding and so ended. So there was nobody living there. These buildings with walls and foundations made of cinder block, but with no doors or windows, and in some cases, no roofs. So I went to Sharia. You can see here, I went to a child-friendly space. This looks like the inside of one of them. And I found the children playing a game similar to musical chairs with their mats. One of the girls, Nariman, started to feel sick. And so the animators, the teachers who participate, can see with the CRS shirts on, took her outside and called her father. Once her father came, Nariman ran to him and gave him a big hug and was just so happy to see him. And he embraced her with such love and compassion. And I thought, wow, here are these people who've been forced to flee from their homes. They must be under incredibly high levels of stress. And they're in a home that at the time, it was summer and so winter hadn't come yet. But they imagined that as soon as winter was coming, where were they going to stay? They didn't have a safe roof over their heads. And yet, the father could calm himself down and push away his own worries to come and pick up his daughter, who wasn't feeling well from her child-friendly space, give her a hug, embrace her, and take her home. And I thought, you know, I have a lot to give, yes, in this type of work. I can help design programs such as the Child Friendly Spaces program. I can help design transition to education programs. I can go out in the field and talk to people and make sure that our programs reflect what their actual needs and wants are in their context, on their terms. But at the same time, I have so much to learn. I can't imagine ever remaining that calm in that type of situation with that amount of stress like Nariman's father did. So the unfinished houses I spoke of, this is what they look like. These actually have benefited from the um, project that CRS began for housing with um, the PVC windows and doors, which I think you can see. That was part of a project in addition to the Child Friendly Spaces project in Sharia in order to ensure families had access to safe and private housing. Safe and private being defined as safe from the cold and the heat by having sealed doors and windows and roofs and private because in uh, one of these houses, you could have three to four families living there with 35 to 40 people. And so we realized and recognized that people's dignity felt seriously in question when they were having to share one big room with that many families. And so we worked with the community to figure out what is their definition of privacy? What would work for these nuclear families? And we worked with them to put up partitions within the houses so each nuclear family would have its own room. So some of the internal partitions we had. We also installed handrails because the houses weren't finished. Families were telling us that children were climbing up the stairs and falling and hurting themselves and they didn't have access to the kind of health care that could help their children. In Sharia, along with other places, we also 
had a food distribution program. Now your typical image of a food distribution program might be um, bringing bags of flour and rice to people in need, as we've seen on the media over the years. However, we recognize that oftentimes when we bring big barrels of rice and flour, we're giving people items that aren't actually the needs of their family or what the types of foods are that they eat. Therefore, we started a voucher program, a program where a family receives 16, the equivalent of 16 US dollars per person in the family per month of vouchers that are redeemable in the local market that they can go to and purchase staples like flour and rice, but they can also purchase eggs and yogurt and meat on occasion and things that make their family feel comfortable. So I understand often that hearing these stories can feel overwhelming and perhaps surreal. It's interesting because it's just a 12 hour flight from Chicago to Istanbul. And in 12 hours, I personally can go from my Starbucks latte drinking existence on the beautiful University of Chicago campus in Chicago. And in 12 hours, I am in Istanbul. Two more hours, I am in southern Turkey. And I'm hearing the stories of my colleagues like Omar, my friend whose brother has been detained for now more than three years and she hasn't heard from him. And I think, how is it possible? It feels so far when I'm drinking my Starbucks and drinking my latte and then all of a sudden I'm there and it's very, very real. It can be hard to organize in my head what I'm feeling, what I'm experiencing, and, and, and how to live with what I see and what's happening. But I find over time that the most important and useful way to organize what I experience in my head is just never to be complacent, never to think that I actually understand what somebody else is going through, never to think, oh, they should have made this decision instead of this decision, when I have no knowledge of the circumstances of their life that led them to make that decision. I'll quote uh, an anthropologist, Saba Mahmoud, who you very usefully, I think, says, in order for us to be able to judge in a morally and politically informed way, even those practices we consider objectionable, it is important to take into consideration the desires, the motivations, the commitments, and aspirations of the people to whom those practices are important. And I try to keep that in mind as I go from place to place, from country to country, and faced with things that I don't quite understand or decisions that maybe I would have taken differently. Finally, I understand there are, I think one more slide, um, a number of students here. And so I'll speak very briefly before closing about my trajectory getting into this work. I grew up, uh, as I mentioned, in a suburb of Chicago and attended college at Loyola University Chicago. It was at Chicago, at Loyola Chicago, that I began to think about issues of social justice and began to realize the incredible privilege that I had from my socioeconomic background, from my race, from my religion. I volunteered at a center for Latino immigrants, and it was there that I realized that there are people who are just as hardworking and smart as I am, but have it a lot harder to get the same opportunities that I have available to me. Because of what I learned there, I decided to study abroad. Plug for studying abroad for the students here. If you can do it, I think that can be the most transformative part of the college experience. So I went to Chile, to Santiago in Chile, where I spent six months studying at the Jesuit University in Chile. And I decided while I was there, I definitely wanted to work internationally for a variety of reasons. One, I just love traveling. I love getting on planes and being in new places and being faced with people who think differently or have different practices than I do. Two, I'd begun to realize that my upbringing was very sheltered, that when I turned on the television at my home in my suburb in Chicago, what I was faced with was a series of stories of what was happening in the US. And I had, it had taken studying abroad to realize there's a lot, a lot happening in the rest of the world that I just wasn't exposed to in my city, in my town, in my country. And I wanted to spend some more time learning what was happening in these other places. Third, I knew I wanted to work for social justice 
but I didn't really know how. I recognize and still recognize that I am not single-handedly going to change the dynamic of global power relations, but I couldn't not at least try to do something to have my part to make my commitment to work for social justice. I graduated from Loyola, majored in international studies, I minored in theology, and I joined the Peace Corps, where I spent two years in Morocco as a volunteer. Um, it was, again, a very transformative experience, just living in a small rural country, uh, rural village for two and a half years, getting to know some amazing people on a very intimate level, understanding this group of girls who I'd spend every afternoon with, what their lives were like, um, what excited them, what interested them, what their ideas about Americans were. And it, it definitely confirmed for me that I wanted to continue working overseas. I went to Fordham in New York for my Master of Arts in International Political Economy and Development, and that's where I got connected with Catholic Relief Services. So I started as an intern in Rwanda, and then received a fellowship uh, to go to Egypt, and then was hired on in Egypt as uh, an interfaith program manager where I spent a couple of years before beginning to work on humanitarian response, emergency response programs, which led me to Lebanon, to Iraq, um, and to Turkey. It was about a year and a half ago now that I decided that I still wanted to continue my work in humanitarian aid, but that I felt that it's important to also turn back to my home country and to think about what are the resources available to Americans to better understand the Middle East, to better understand the Muslim faith. And so now I split my time, as I believe Teresa mentioned, between work for CRS in Southern Turkey um, and as a graduate student at Islamic Studies at the University of Chicago. Thank you. Um, so I am very interested in mission work, and I was wonder. I have kind of a, a lot of questions. Um, first of all, <laughs> sorry, this is. Um, would you recommend going straight into, if it's possible, working for CRS or? Um, going into the Peace Corps, kind of what would you recommend, or um, continuing on with schooling first? Out of getting your bachelor's degree. I mean, people definitely do it in very different ways. Um, there are a number of my colleagues um, overseas who went to undergrad, um, got jobs working for a local nonprofit, for example, in their home city, and then were connected to CRS through a domestic position. So CRS has offices, um, regional offices. There's one in Chicago, headquarters is in Baltimore, and sometimes positions open for relationship managers or fair trade officers. Um, and so I know a number of people who first started in those positions, spent some time in those positions, and then got connected overseas. Another way is through the fellowship program, and CRS I think is one of the few organizations that every year accepts I think 25 to 30 fellows. The fellowship program, however, has the requirement of having a master's degree and having at least two years of experience living overseas. So there's very different ways of going about it. In my fellowship group, there are people like me who had done undergrad, Peace Corps, master's degree, fellow, internship, fellowship. There are other people who'd been working for 10 years doing grant writing for another nonprofit um, or working, for example, for Catholic Charities or some other organization that was nonprofit. So it's, it can very much differ. Yeah, please. How do you handle risk and danger? That's a great question. My mom might have a very different answer to that question. <laughs> I remember in, uh, I was in Egypt in 2011 when the uprisings happened and I'm in all kinds of stress um, for my parents, uh, as you can imagine. I think that for me it's, I handle it for, in two, well three ways, we'll say three ways. One is that I'm very proactive when I'm going to a new place and researching what's happening. Um, knowing, okay, I'm going to Duhok in Iraq. Iraq is like a really scary place to say you're going to, especially over the past, let's say, 15 years. 
But I go and I say, okay, Duhok is in northern Iraq, it's in Kurdish Iraq, um, it's relatively stable, I read about it online. So that's one. Two is I really trust CRS, um, Catholic Relief Services, and many other organizations, not all, but Catholic Relief Services is one that has a very, very strong um, sense of staff security. And so we have um, a security advisor who will come out to a new place we're thinking about going and do assessments and make sure that it's in fact safe for staff, international staff like myself to come to, local staff to be gathering Iraqis together to work at a CRS office um, and for the beneficiaries. And so it can sometimes take a long time to go to a new place because there are so many security procedures to get there. And I think the third for me is also just managing my own stress and recognizing that self-care is very important in the field, um, that a lot of people can get burned out doing this type of work and hearing too many stories that can be very frustrating. Um, and CRS, again, does a great job of uh, connecting its staff to resources for self-care. Um, and so for me, I'll get up wherever I am around the world, as long as it's safe and CRS approves of me doing it, I'll get up at six and I go for a run every morning. And that helps me um, deal with my own stress. <clears throat> yes? Um. Is there a relation between CRS and current Yes, absolutely. Uh, and Caritas. Uh, Caritas being essentially the Catholic charities of other countries. So Caritas Internationales um, is based in Rome at the Vatican and they're the, I guess, not the parent organization, but the group of Caritas all over the world, Caritas organizations all over the world. In the United States, we don't call ourselves Caritas. We have two organizations that are independent and we call them Catholic Charities and Catholic Relief Services, um, but we're essentially the Caritas of America. So what we do when we go to new places and we meet with the Caritas is we say like, we're the Caritas of America because it's in language that they understand. Um, so in my experience, for example, in Iraq, um, we work, we share an office with Caritas in Duhok. So neither Caritas nor CRS had a presence in Duhok before August 2014. Uh, we were both in Erbil, which is a little bit south of Duhok, um, and we worked together and decided there are strong needs in, um, in Duhok, and so we went and we established an office together. And oftentimes, while CRS hires local staff, so people from the community in Duhok, Caritas has history a much longer history in the relationships with the local church officials, um, with the local community. And so in Iraq, for example, we work very closely with Caritas. In Turkey, um, we have separate offices, but in each location where we work, we work closely um, with Caritas. So I got back from Turkey last week and I was there for a month um, this past trip and I was daily on the phone with somebody from Caritas Turkey. Yes. Uh, I've heard about and read about uh, areas that you're describing where there are, are multiple NGOs. I'm curious if that is true in areas you've worked and how well do they work together and are they all competing for dollars and services or how do they function together? That is a great question. And I think it can depend on the, um, the point that we're in and the timeline of the crisis um, or the natural disaster or whatever the emergency is in the case of emergency response. Um, right now, for example, in Turkey, we go regularly to coordination meetings. We have our um, education team that goes to the education coordination meetings. Each sector, each different area will go to the coordination meetings with the UN and with all the other NGOs in the area working in that sector. So it's making sure we're not duplicating services and makes sure, making sure that we're reaching areas that maybe another NGO hasn't reached. Um, 
And it's also making sure that we're aligning our programming so that in one village, you don't have an NGO that's building these beautiful schools, state-of-the-art schools with great technology, and then in another village, you have um, some simple backpacks being handed out to children. So a lot of very good coordination happens in Turkey. Um, it's like that now in Iraq, but when we first started, it was a lot more difficult. Um, in the, I was in the Philippines after, immediately after the typhoon, um, when was that, 2014? I believe, um, and in those immediately in the immediate aftermath of a natural disaster or a conflict, it can be a, a much more challenging process to coordinate with other organizations. The effort is made, um, but there can be overlap where we believe that we were told that we are going to provide tarps, for example, in the Philippines to this one neighborhood, and we get there and they already receive tarps from another organization. Um, but I think that on that point, something that I've learned is that it's very important to support organizations that say that they do coordinate. Because some small groups will go to a conflict area or to uh, in the aftermath of a natural disaster and bring a bunch of blankets, for example, and just distribute them to whoever they see. The problem with that is because it creates um, inequalities between people, and so all of a sudden, this group of people have blankets and this group doesn't and the organizations that are there are trying to identify, okay, who has blankets and who doesn't, who do we need to reach? Um, so for me, I've learned that it's important to do research about the organizations we donate to and make sure that they are in fact coordinating with other organizations. Yeah. In the back with the red shirt. Yeah. Hi, Erin. Um, Hi. <laughs> Two quick things. Uh, one, I'm a proud alum of Marion University. Again, still getting used to saying it. Uh, and I'll let you know about how long it's been. My first year was President Elzer's first year. So uh, that's about when I started here at Marion. Uh, I, too, am a Return Peace Corps volunteer. Oh, cool. As this young man here is. Uh, he just got back about a couple hours ago, I guess. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. Three o'clock today. <laughs> About a couple of weeks ago, we're still trying to teach him what Snapchat is and uh, Instagram, <laughs> so he's still getting used to things. Uh, to the students, uh, real quick, uh, I'd like to put in a plug for an event we're having, uh, the Marion International Week. Uh, it's the third week of November. Uh, November 18th, uh, Peace Corps will be here and we'll be doing a panel. Uh, I and uh, three other people that are far more articulate than I am will be there and uh, telling, uh, sharing our stories. Uh, there'll be uh, Marion um, employees actually too, so you can look them up. Uh, two, if, if you want to uh, hang out after, I'll be happy to uh, talk about a little bit about our experience, but we can also hook you up with the Chicago Peace Corps re uh, Recruiting Office. Um, uh, and hook you up with the recruiter there. Uh, also, too, um, we have the ND Peace Corps community, and uh, we'd love to help uh, talk to you guys about uh, serving uh, in any kind of capacity. Um, we have a, a vast array of people that love to talk about their experiences. Like I am right now, they just keep talking. Um, <laughs> And then uh, lastly, for you, Erin, um, for your research on your, on your spaces, your children's spaces, where do you go about um, planning and researching about how to create a, a space for, for children and refugees? That is a great question. Um, what country did you do, the two of you do Peace Corps? Belize. Belize. Also Belize? Nicaragua. Very cool. This I'm thing's pretty high tech for me. <laughs> Um, so that's a great question. Designing projects uh, is a serious undertaking because, for example, I designed our child-friendly spaces project, and I am not, and I was not an education major. I am not an expert in child well-being. I am not an expert in counseling um, or anything related to that, and. Um, Therefore, it would not make sense for me to alone design a program supporting children. Um, so what we do when we design projects is bring in the support of technical advisors. Um, 
one, two, we coordinate with other organizations, like I mentioned, to see what is the type of work that they're planning on doing in this sector. And then three, I spend a lot of time reading best practices, technical guides that have been put out by other organizations in similar situations that say, this is the type of project that has worked, for example, in this other context. Um, with those, a lot of that is done um, with technical advisors from all over the world with organizations from all over the world. And we'll, um, for a, a big project, we'll fly people in to the location and we'll have week long, two week long workshops on design of the type of project. Now that's one side of it. The other side of it is working with the future beneficiaries of the project. Um, so I think like anybody who's taken a development or humanitarian aid class is development 101 is, you know, you build a well, but maybe that community didn't want a well. And so the well stands not being used and people are still walking, you know, 10 miles to get water every day because we didn't go and ask Will you use a well? How do you like to get your water? What would make getting water easier for you? Um, so before any technical advisors are brought in, before any other resources are consulted, we spend um, a lot of time going to the locations where the project will be, um, doing needs assessments there. So we'll have general needs assessments at first, talking with um, Families, we split groups between men and women. We split age groups if we're targeting youth between different ages. And we just have what we call focus group discussions where we ask very leading questions, but general questions about their specific needs, what's appropriate to them, what they're looking for. Um, and then based on those findings, we'll consult with our technical advisors, go back to another in-depth needs assessment, and talk about the particulars of safety of getting to these places. What are the specific activities in the chase of, case of a child project um, that children are interested in participating in and that their parents want for them? Uh, sir, in the black brown shirt. Uh, uh, you can. I mean, can you hear? Yeah. What uh, are you aware of? Plan Plan B security. Things happen fast in the Middle East, uh, and are there alternative security plans for you? I'm asking that as a parent. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that it's a very good point on the security question. Um, depending on where we, we are, we'll have um, an evacuation uh, contract with an evacuation company, for example, um, that will have give us daily briefings on what the situation is and their key locations, and will, um, for example, in Iraq, we had three or four different um, possible exits from the hook. And so some are by land, some are by air, um, and other places where we don't deem the security situation to be that um, imminently dangerous or we're near an airport plus a very close land crossing, um, we wouldn't have that type of, um, of contract. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have, we're still good on time? Yeah. Okay. Yes. With all the different forms of government and with the interactions that take place and with the strife, the internal strife and civil wars and so on and so forth in the Middle East and elsewhere, how would you talk a little bit about how non governmental agents, aid agencies, go about interacting with? those various forms of governance? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I don't know that it's in my pay grade to make those ultimate decisions about um, working, how we're going to work with governments, but I can say that we often take our cues from the local caritas or the local church officials. And so in a new place, what caritas tells us based on their however many years, many, many years um, in the country, um, what the best way forward is for 
relations with the governments, um, and oftentimes it will be the bishops or um, the heads of Caritas who make the initial connections between CRS um, and the government um, in the countries that I've worked in, and this is not the same elsewhere. It's very different in Latin America, for example, but in the countries where I've worked, um, we stay completely out of politics, 100% out of any political statements about being for or against certain sides of the conflict. Um, um, very intentionally and we take it very seriously in order not to endanger any of our staff or any of our beneficiaries um, and we'll work with um, the authorities that are in the location we're working. Yes. You briefly uh, mentioned uh, watching TV in America and um, being overwhelmed and um, so just out of curiosity, do you um, have any news sites or specific reporters that you go to when you want kind of an accurate picture of how things are going, specifically in relation to um, NGOs or social justice abroad? That's a great question. Um, I remember asking the same question to a political science professor of mine, an undergrad, um, and he pointed me to The Economist. Some people like it, some people hate it, but the good thing about it is that it comes out every week and it has um, a section for different, each different region of the world. It has an entire section on Africa and the Middle East. I mean, it covers a lot more than um, what I was exposed to at the time, so I read that for a number of years. In terms of what NGOs are doing, um, I think it's it's either The Guardian or The Independent, one of the UK news channels that has a humanitarian aid and NGO um, section. And so they have an entire section devoted to talking about what's happening in that industry. Um, you'd have to Google them perhaps to see which one it was. Did, yeah, Dr. Atlas. Um, yeah, I just want to ask a question. First, I want to just say that the guy back there in the red shirt um, is a former, uh, people always ask, what can I do with a degree in political science? Yeah. Um, so he's one of my former students from uh, way back, way back when. Um, be good to see you later on. Um, so my question is, you, you just got back from Turkey, you said like a, a week Last ago. Last week, right? yeah. So can you just briefly talk about what difference, if any, has the coup and counter coup made in terms of what, what's going on um, from your perspective? And also, uh, have you had any encounters with people in the Gulen movement um, and is that, is there, because when, when I went to Turkey, it was on one of their interfaith trips, and, and, I'm, and they seem to be very interested in interfaith stuff. They're being weeded out and purged, and what's your take on all of that from your own first-hand experience? I mean, my experience in Turkey pre-coup attempt and post-coup attempt, um, my experience is that there was zero difference in my day-to-day -day work with CRS. Um, CRS is a registered organization, and we have good relationships with the Turkish government. They know that we're there, um, so there hasn't been any um, of the impact that maybe we've heard about for other institutions um, post-coup. Um, but in, I was in Jordan earlier in the summer um, doing a classical Arabic language program, um, and I was with a number of Turkish students who were affiliated in one way or another with a uh, university, and they were part of the group of people who were asked to go back to Turkey um, and just spend a little bit of time in Turkey to um, be present and to make sure everyone was comfortable with their activities um, and they were fine with that. They were happy to go back. Um, and I've never met anyone um, who has uh, told me um, explicitly or otherwise that they're um, involved with or connected at all to the Gulen movement. Um, so it's been really, well, other than the news and what we learned about, and you know, we had staff who didn't you know, on lockdown for a while just to make sure everything was okay. It hasn't impacted CRS's daily lives in Turkey. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I had the privilege. Okay. I had the privilege of living in Egypt for the first twenty years of my life. Oh, wonderful! And I also had the honor to follow my roots from Catholic Church, who gave me great capabilities and. Seminar book, 
the spring, yeah. <laughs> okay, and uh, what is the situation? How safe is it now? What's the role of the Catholic Church? And also recently, over 200 young Egyptians just lost their life trying to cross uh, in another country. What's the situation there? Wow, 20 years. That's amazing. Uh, what, uh, what, do you know what governor the father you were speaking of worked in? There were several Catholic uh, presidents. There was a Dominican that were doing a lot of work. Mm. There was fathers and men who were helping it, but also big folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Father Ayrut has seen it. I don't exactly remember. I can look it up because I have his book. That's great. Uh, but it was really wonderful. Here. So very strong presence. Yeah. So our and audience the member. Now. Yeah. Um, she grew up and lived the first 20 years of her life in Cairo, or in, in Cairo? In Cairo. Um, I think that's great. I worked as part of the interfaith peace building project I worked on. We worked with um, Al-Azhar, which is the Sunni preeminent intellectual institution um, in Cairo. And we worked with the Coptic Catholic Church. Um, we worked with a number of local organizations and we worked with um, the Coptic Orthodox Church. Um, and so I'm very fond of these different religious institutions and the way they work together. Um, I was in Egypt from 2011 to 2014 most of that time, um, and I, the situation just changed by sometimes the day. I mean, I think since um, the removal of um, Hamid Morsi from the presidency and um, uh, Sisi becoming president of Egypt, it's um, politically been a lot more stable. Um, my, I haven't been there in a year, more than a year now, a year and a half, um, but I understand from colleagues that um, it's, they feel safe and they feel comfortable um, just as it was prior to 2011. <laughs> so we want to take one more question and sure. we'll do the break. Sure, so, yeah. What percentage, what percentage of Local people who use program programs? That is a great question, and it's one that I should have mentioned early on. Um, the overwhelming majority. So, in Iraq, for example, our country representative, um, he's Egyptian, and myself, there were myself and two other um, non Iraqi, non Syrians, and then we had maybe 150, 200 staff who were Iraqi or Syrian. Um, when possible, we, CRS works to hire at all levels um, people from the local community who know the local needs much better than me flying in with my lattes from Chicago. Um, so it's different in different countries depending on the types of experience available. So for example, in Turkey, um, prior to the Syrian crisis, a lot of Turks had never had any experience in emergency response. Emergency response wasn't an intelligible thing to people in Turkey. Um, and so we had more people coming in from outside in the beginning um, to manage some of the programs. But slowly, as time goes on, we try and phase out people like myself um, and phase in more um, uh, Turks and Syrians to management positions, et cetera. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh